Hello, let me test my mic. Good. <laughs> Do you know, we've got a theme running here with shoes uh, this morning. Tell us more about those. Those are awesome. They're amazing. Well, you know what? I love these shoes, but they're medicinal because I used to wear dress shoes to an event like this, and I started getting a toe that would get put out a joint. And it would be so painful to walk, painful, painful. And I just wore my tennis shoes once, and whoo, it was a little bit more relaxed and set aside nine, I got 10 and a half, and it doesn't happen as often. So it's medicinal. But actually, the first time I ever saw somebody wear shoes like this, it was Biz Stone, one of the founders of Twitter, came into a, a little bit late onto a stage in Korea, and he was wearing these bright tennis shoes, bright trainers, and I, I said, that actually looks cool, and nobody says anything bad about it. <laughs> so I, I love wearing them. I get a lot of compliments. <laughs> I, guess I guess I'm brave. In, business in the suit Taking and party risk. in the shoes here. Uh, yes, I have worn that. these shoes with tuxedos even. But my feet need care too. Awesome. So I think let's start off with innovation. I think innovation is one of those uh, words that's overused, in my, in my opinion. Everyone's talking around how they're an innovative company, and uh, there's no doubt it's an important theme. What does innovation mean to you? I was just going to say that one of the problems with it is what does innovation mean? Absolutely. I mean, it could just mean any little improvements. Oh, we're innovating. Our engineers are working to make things better than they were. Um, innovation, you know, crosses over to invention. I look at it as engineering knowing how to follow rules and mathematics and studies and create new things, create bridges, whatever. Um, engineers are needed to keep building the products of today and keep them running well and improve them. But then there's inventors. And the inventor is usually a guy that gets a weird idea, weird, risky. It's, out of the, it's not the way things are done. It's not the way it's been described in books. It's sort of like, I wonder if I could do something a di totally different way, very different than other people expected. Maybe make a, make a smartphone that's all one screen with no keyboard, whatever it is. And that sort of invention, that's, uh, that's the one that I admire. But you need both, and you need both types of innovation, too, in a company. Um, but the, in the inventor kind of has an idea and wants to run into a laboratory and has a breadth of skills, many disciplines, to actually be able to build working models, test a theory, put things together, whether it's soldering, working out some programs and software, and build a complete working thing, sometimes just to show off. And some innovation starts that way. Nobody thinks it's worth a lot of money and a huge, big company. I mean, look at, uh, look at um, the movie The Social Network, you know, and here came Facebook out of a dorm room. What big companies believed in it? What big companies believed in the personal computer? When Apple started, I mean, the big companies were saying, it doesn't do the job that computers are used for. Yeah, it doesn't do the old job. They did marketing research. They knew how people used computers. These little computers are too small, you know, and they won't grow up and become that big for ages. But they didn't talk to the new market. Their market research didn't cover lawyers, doctors, dentists, students, teachers, all the normal people of life that might, at first, just want to be um, a hobbyist. I want to say, I have this thing called a computer in my house. Nobody's ever had a computer in the house. You know? But so that was um, a very different stage where we took a risk. In other words, we didn't know that it wasn't really going to be successful. Thankfully, we started Apple with a great product. It was going to be our only successful product for our first 10 years of Apple. It was that big a deal. But you know what? Games were the key. Understanding the market is important. Being the market's even better. And I was a game designer and a game player. And you know what? I'd go down to Atari, and I designed Breakout for Atari. Their games were hardware games. Hardware means you looked at the signals on chips and connected wires between pins, soldered wires in place, and it took you like six months at least to design a new game or to even try a principle you thought of for a game. It would take a long time to design it on paper and solder it together with hardware. And the Atari arcade games with moving things on a screen. This, was, this is our world today of games, things move on a screen. They were all black and white TVs. They didn't know how to do color. Color was too expensive. The parts that could create color were too expensive. And a typical circuit that would create color was $1,000. Well, I said, games are important. And I was inspired by the thought, games could be color. And I came up with an idea of how to do color for $0. It was normally $1,000. 
how to do it for zero dollars, and it was a weird concept that could never have been in a book. It was true invention, because in a book, there were all these, these ways to design circuits with custom, expensive, precision parts, and differential calculus mathematics design a circuit that can mix red, green, and blue waves and create color for an American television in assist the format that we used. And something popped into my head because I was up four days and nights with no sleep designing a game for Atari that should have taken six months. And my head was wandering. I said, color goes up and down, waves go up and down. And what popped in my head was, what if I sent a digital signal? Zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, up and down. If I sent it at the right rate, every color TV would think it was color. So the number three no longer had to go into a $1,000 circuit to create red. The number three was red. Don't ask me where these ideas come from. <laughs> I, look back, I look back and I say, how did anybody think of these things? But it made, it made personal computer a viable product because games were going to be the start. Games are often, look at virtual reality. If it goes or doesn't go, it's got a good chance of going because it's gonna be a big deal for games. And that was, so that was an invention. I had many, many more inventions. Also making it so that games were no longer hardware. The Apple II that we started our company with, games were now software. For the first time ever, arcade games with moving things on a screen were as simple that a nine-year-old kid, student, could write vertical equals one, vertical equals two, Vertical equals three, vertical equals four, vertical equals five, and make things move on a screen, make a red dot move on the screen. It was that easy. So that had never existed. So um, it's, that's, that's one of, well, sometimes when you invent something, you know it's great, you know it's the basis of a new future, and sometimes you're right, and sometimes you invent a great thing and you're still wrong. I, Atari for me is the one that takes me back. Who remember? Who had an Atari? Uh, in, you know, the oldies are straight at the back up there. The Atari Pong. I remember that dot bouncing around on the skin uh, when Dad brought the Atari games console home for me, and he plugged it in, and we saw that dot mm -hmm. bouncing around. That for me was the future. Yeah. I mean, when I when I saw that, that well, was where we were going. Pong was first an arcade machine yeah. alley, and I'm like you. You see something, you say, "Whoa, this is something new." And in those days, we only had pinball games. Beep, 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 ball bouncing around, yeah. ding, 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 ding. That's what we had, and they cost 10 cents to play. Mm. I went into Bowling Alley, and here's this new machine called Pong, and it cost 25 cents to play. Mm. And two people had to play it, bouncing a ball back and forth. It, it looks pretty, pretty cheap by today's standards. Oh my gosh, you can have a game on a television. You can have an output device on a television can be a game. Everyone in the world has a television. Oh my gosh, I know digital electronics. I can design anything in the world to put signals on my TV. I know how TV works from high school electronics. So I went and built my own Pong. And it was 28 little $1 chips because I had, be, I had trained myself to be like the ultimate in the world of minimizing the cost and number of parts and things. Steve Jobs came into town around that time. And we'd had a company selling one of my things before, but about once a year, he'd come into town, and that was the year. He took that Atari board that I'd built that played Pong, and I had two little chips that if you missed the ball, it put a four-letter word on the screen, like heck. And, uh, and Steve took it down to Atari. He got this idea. Atari is a big moving force in the world. And he went down, and, um, and he, he just goes right to the top people and talks his way in. He's impressive the way he, he sounds, and he's, he's always passionate and moving about things, so they hired him, and I think they thought that he designed it. <laughs> but they considered using my Pong as their first home Pong game that they were gonna sell, where you could hook it up to your own TV, yeah. very inexpensive, and play Pong. It was gonna be mine, but then they made a smart decision. They said, no, we're gonna sell a million of these. If you're gonna sell a million of them, you don't want them to cost $28 to build. You want it one chip, so it costs a dollar to build. So Atari took a year and designed the chip. Steve Mayer at Atari did it, and they, then they had their home pong game. But I was close on that one, man, because I get attracted to the things that are changing in life that hadn't been here before, attract me all the time. And sometimes you get hooked onto something, you think it's gonna be great, and you're wrong, and sometimes you're right. <laughs>